It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gabrielle Tayek. She's going to give a talk titled Chesapeake Rematriation, Piscataway Womanly Culture. Dr. Tayak is a member of the Piscataway Indian Nation and an activist scholar committed to empowering indigenous perspectives. She earned her PhD and master's in sociology from Harvard University and her BS in social work and American Indian studies from Cornell University. Her scholarly research focuses on hemispheric American Indian identity, multiracialism, indigenous religions, and social movements. Dr. Tayak served on the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian staff for 18 years as the museum's first education director and then as a historian and curator and now serves as an associate professor of public history at George Mason University. Tonight she's going to talk to us or her talk will explore indigenous cultural worldviews, how colonialism and later assimilative policies impacted these traditions, explore historic tribal losses and then celebrate revitalizations that we've seen surge over the last 50 years. So Dr. Tayak, thank you very much for joining us and with that I will hand it over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Greg, and to the um, Jefferson Patterson um, Park and Museum team for welcoming me here. I see a number of, of people have um, have joined us, some who are who are long connected and in community, and others who uh, we're new to each other. So I just want to. Um, be sure to, you know, even though we're, you know, virtual and again, as we were kind of commenting before, it's definitely we're in a situation where we where we've become more and more comfortable um, with this kind of format. Um, and at the same time, um, it's, uh, you know, it means like I can't see all of your faces um, or or kind of have that have that connection. So I just want to, you know, as we're we're in an evening on a on an early summer night, uh, we just came through the solstice, uh, so long days, and this is a another cycle that we're in, um, and also to uh, be mindful that tonight is the night of a full moon uh, and so it's very appropriate for us to be talking about about the feminine and about the reclamation and uh, what I would call regeneration of culture. I really want to focus this evening uh, together on uh, you know it's like we've had we've had such an intense year of of loss and um, trauma and disorientation that now that we're we're at a point where um you know the we're coming into this other cycle it's it's a good time for us to also think about uh recovering and you know knowing that there's still still a ways to go um people have all gone through this and in varying degrees of of hardship so just want to acknowledge that and and looking at the idea that we're really at a point where in a way we're coming uh, back uh, into uh, an indigenous uh, perspective which is very holistic um, and not in a kind of romantic like mystical way but like if we really look um, and observe um, and then tease out what we can what we can see um, in our environment in our cultures uh, what we're coming back to the point that we've we've made it through all this time and space um, that we we've made it together so I did want to invite you um, if it's not too confusing toggling in between the Q and a and the chat, um, I absolutely uh, welcome you if you would like to just type into the chat. You can just um, introduce yourself where you are. It doesn't have to be in order. You can just put it in. And also, if you have um, a, a feminine um, ancestor uh, who is maybe um, grounding with you tonight because you know in some ways uh, of course going on the academic route uh we we're looking at the you know factual pieces research history 
but we also need to understand um, about what our connections is. So I certainly um, invite you um, to that and I'll be introducing you um, to the person who, who I'm bringing, whose name was Jan Jan Sipi or Jenny Collins, um, my great grandmother um, who was known as the champion snake killer of Charles County. <laughs> and also um, was a person who maintained um, a lineage along the high banks of the Potomac and, and medicinal practices uh, that, that I'm very thankful for. So there's so many people who, who make us up um, uh, in many directions, but that's somebody I wanted to, to bring with us on this, on this evening. So I'm going to go ahead and... Um, see if I can share my screen. Um, I've been more used to Zoom. Um, and then when I put up the, um, when I actually put up the, the slides, what I've noticed on my side, just so that you know <laughs> what's going on on my end, um, I can't see, I, I actually can't see anything but the slides, or I can only see, I'm just gonna keep it this size, um, if that's okay. And if I can just ask um, Greg or somebody else who's looking, if you're able to see this, because if I make it full screen, then I'm not gonna be able to see any chat, any um, messages, I'm not sure, I'll feel a little lost. So just mm -hmm. how does this look right we, now? We can uh, see it, but it's the full screen and the, the main slide is, is kind of small. Maybe there's a way you could, remove the screen, like the, the scroll bar on the right and the left, it may make that larger. Yeah, let me just check and thanks everybody for the presentation. You can close the alt text on the right where there's the little X beside alt text. Okay. Oh, there we go. Also, let me just see what happens. Um, okay, so right now, like, all I can see completely are my slides. So um, if anybody types anything, <laughs> I'm gonna have to rely on Greg to, um, if there's, you know, a, a question. Um, and uh -huh. we have to do that by voice because I can only see, um, I can only see the slides. Okay, if anything comes up, I will. Uh, okay, we'll all right. All right. I, I believe it, all right. So, um, again, you know, just really um, welcoming you and getting a sense of understanding of, of what, what do we mean by this term, rematriation? What is it? Um, you might have heard of repatriation, and repatriation goes along the lines of work that was done over decades, over a long period of time, um, from the indigenous community and allies um, in the archaeological, anthropological um, community and the scholarly community, the museum community, who had been holding on to um, numerous objects, human remains uh, within different collections. And so the idea of repatriating, there was a, a, a law that was called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, there's a similar law um, that was passed in Maryland. And um, what it basically means is that if there's anything that is a sacred object, um, human remains, items of what they call cultural patrimony. So, you know, imagine like, um, you know, the Declaration of Independence, like something really important, it gets held by somebody, uh, some other foreign government, um, somebody who doesn't, have that within their own society, you want it back, so you have something called repatriation. Um, that's how we often use the term. Um, I first heard this term rematriation in 2013. I had uh, an opportunity to go to um, Oxford, England. I was just remembering this day, you know how like Facebook, um, you have the memories and they they pop up and <laughs> And so today this this image came up. I had gone to Oxford to go look at, at objects from the Chesapeake region, one in particular called the um, Powhatan's Mantle, which is from present day Virginia, um, that came from, um, they believe from um, 
Pocahontas' father or Matoka's father, um, Wahasakana, um, and also looking at some other early, early contact materials. Um, and while I was looking at this, I was texting um, back and forth with um, Native American women, primarily from the Atlantic seaboard, some in Virginia, some in North Carolina, some in Maryland, some up and down the coast. And I was looking, I was like, oh, I'm looking at it. I'm here, I'm in Oxford, I'm looking at this, this object. And um, some people said, oh, get it repatriated. And then somebody said, rematriate it, rematriate it. And that was the first time I had heard that um, term. And right now that term has been really expanded and reclaimed and created to mean it's the returning of the returning of the reinstallation of um, the maternal, the feminine, um, both uh, spiritual, intellectual, cultural presence that is in relationship with Mother Earth, which is so traditional, and the positioning that we have um, as indigenous uh, people, and of course, diverse people across the world, and those of you who um, are conscious and, um, as my kids would say, woke <laughs> um, in, this, in these areas where you start to see um, what's what's our relationship to place in each other and and how to reinstall that kind of of understanding um, so Chesapeake being the region the idea that we are looking at both uh, companion terms of repatriation and rematriation and the concept of what I call Piscataway womanly culture and that's what I want to get into tonight was what's the base of it um, what's the philosophical grounding of it, um, how it's infused um, in objects and practices, how it was uh, taken, stolen, submerged, repressed, and then the work that's been done to start to bring this back, um, some of which has been, you know, continuing for a long time, but in the value um, of, of this process. So I think especially looking along the... Um, our sister rivers um, along the Patuxent and, and where Jeff Pet is and the materials that are, are held there, you have, there's so much um, in the ground, in the surround, in our minds, um, in, in the holdings that relate to this. So it's just important to, to start to work with these concepts. So as I was mentioning um, lineage, um, my um, Piscataway lineage uh, goes, actually goes through the Patriline. I have a wonderful matriline that are, um, extends to Jewish women in Russia, my, who I was raised with, and also by my Piscataway father. Um, on the left here is Jenny Collins um, with her second husband, Jimmy Lincoln. And um, this is the person that I think is one of those people because a lot of times what you see um, with with the way that women hold, hold you know they hold it down right like it's it's this idea that somebody is waking up every day they're making the hominy they go take care of of the um, herbals they make sure everybody's okay the best that they can do it um, and she's the person who maintained um, her presence on the um, Look at the high banks is high cliffs of the Potomac right around the 301 bridge in a place um, called Faulk around Faulkner Port Tobacco, um, which is the site of um, one, one a very old site and, and centering site for Piscataway people, um, a place where there's a Indian it was an Indian mission. Um, established very, very early, very soon after the Ark and the Dove arrived in 1634 and Catholic conversions occurred in um, July uh, 5th, 1640. I know my, um, our elder uh, Rico Newman's in the house and um, certainly we'll, we'll get into discussions about some things, but I, I wanted to bring her with me um, tonight and I just think she just looks tough and cool and um, I'm just thankful. Um, I'm really, really thankful for her um, among the many um, women in my life and men as well. So I just wanted to focus a bit on her this evening too. So what do we mean when we say um, Chesapeake? Um, Chesapeake known as the Great Shellfish Bay. 
um, the mother of waters, this living, breathing space uh, that is formed um, over thousands of years. That is one of in its original forms and its its returning forms, at which are which is done by a massive amount of work. You know, it doesn't just happen. Like we actually have to work at work at this, right? Um, one of the richest biospheres um, known, beautiful, powerful estuary, um, named also for um, oysters, um, which are the lungs of of the bay. Um, I want to uh, pause and and think about because some of some of what I've learned that I'm sharing with you and that I'm 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 pondering through with you as well are um, pieces and parts that you know some are passed down, some are written, and then some um, are embedded in related uh, tribal people that maybe maintained pieces that are connected to ours. And so I've been on a journey for a very long time um, trying to sort this out. Um, none of us have a full picture or a full story. Um, and we're, you know, we're trying to, to piece it together. You know, some that there's some that's been maintained, which is so important, but we also definitely need um, a possibility of, of pulling it back together. Um, okay, I just want to make sure this is not, this wasn't you guys, right? I'm still on, right? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, what we also see here is, again, this, this idea of looking at, you know, Mother of Waters being a salty and saline um, space. Um, it is tidal. It moves like a heart, like uh, blood. The rivers are seen in our um, traditional cultures, veins of Mother Earth's blood that flows through us as well. Um, for those of us who've worked together over a um, period of time, uh, we've talked about this many times, but I also want to share this because there's a range of understanding um, with us tonight. So knowing also that when you have that lack of, of filtering, um, of course, we see quite a number of, of consequences in the work that's being done to restore it. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, Piscataway um, and, 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 who, and who we are, who we've been, um, who we are now, just so that you have a, an understand, you know, more of an understanding of, of um, the, some of the basics. Um, Piscataway actually, in the contemporary sense, um, are recognized by the state of Maryland. Um, but we've also had very long-standing interactions with um, the state, the colony. And then I would like to bring us back even further to understand that we have origins that are very old. Um, when we think about the American continent um, that many Native people call Turtle Island, it's a place with as much history as Europe, as much history as Africa, Asia, um, Oceania. Uh, that is true here. You know, communities and societies rise and fall. They form, they break apart. New things happen. People move. Um, so who we are, um, Piscataway, meaning where the waters uh, blend, you can see this is a, this is, this is like not the best, the best map, but it's not a bad map. It's in the handbook of um, North American Indian Smithsonian, um, volume 15. So you can just kind of get a sense. Um, it's a little easier to see. You can see Washington, D.C., the Potomac, um, coming down to the bay. Of course, we have along the Patuxent. These are basically our boundaries, um, Potomac to Patuxent. So Jeff Pat's kind of in the um, little bit uh, on, on a different on a different uh, range, but there's a lot of interaction and blending areas. So Piscataway, meaning it's a it's a place name where the where the waters blend. We're Algonquin. That's our 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 language family. So like Romance languages, Slavic languages, it's all a language family. Um, we had a chiefdom organization. So like a central, um, basically central uh, kind of government with associated tribes that were all interconnected and interrelated along the other 
uh, tributaries. According to our oral um, tradition, and really if you trace the language, we're descended from Lenape, Lenni Lenape, or, or the Delaware people to the uh, north and east, and then um, through Nanakok, who are on the eastern shore, and then about 13 generations before 1634, there was a chief named Utapoin Gossenum who established um, our, our chiefdom here. I want to go into the, the concept that the world as it was seen and observed um, over time, and you see this ethic um, certainly throughout indigenous societies, it manifests in thousands of ways, it is an idea of being in a, a society that has um, balance, it's based on relationship, it's based on reciprocity. That doesn't mean that everybody acts great all the time. <laughs> I just want to say, you know, that these are the, the concepts and ideals that we have um, in, in, in the societies. So I have two photos here that I took on, on Nanjim White Creek. One kind of came out fuzzy, um, so sorry about that. But on the left, um, you can see there's the moon. Um, so there's a, a moon, the winter cycle, uh, when there's more uh, moonlight, um, it's really in many ways associated, like there's two, there's two balances. You have a, a, mas a masculine and a feminine, but they're always um, interacted with each other. They're always, they always have parts of each other. There's intersectional zones of those ideas. Um, and so with, with winter, um, it is the most moonlight. Grandmother Moon is there. Um, and then the food sources become much more um, like hunting, trapping, uh, forest engagement that uh, was much more in the realm of, of men, but you have the moonlight. Right now we've just come through summer solstice. So the sun is very powerful, which is, a, is considered to be much more of a male force, but you have what's growing is the vegetables, the plants, the um, blossoming, which is very much um, associated with women's work. So that would be shown in Piscataway society is either like a red and black or a red and white. And you see this within uh, Northeastern tribes, Atlantic coast uh, tribes, it can be um, purple and white of masculine and feminine um, balances of what they call the fiddlehead ferns. If you go up like, to Maine in the maritime provinces, this constant balance um, back and forth with, with, um, with culture and tradition. It's a, it's a very fundamental concept. If you look, somebody um, described this to me once, uh, somebody who was Lenape described, I'm trying to remember who did, but it was this really interesting concept about like you can see the um, where the river and the water is shaped by the land, but they, you know, they're not separate. Like they they have to come together. So I guess in a way it's like in many Eastern philosophies with the yin and the yang, but it has its own um, pieces to it. So this is a fundamental concept um, about about uh, gender, gender balance, um, complementarity relationship and I'm, I'm sharing this with you because sometimes you need like a basic for like I've been looking for basic framework sometimes and working with um, indigenous elder women knowledge holders um, really actually across the America spending quite a lot of time with them um, to get to get the ba some of the some of the concepts and then bring it back and and figure it out so we have you know basis of knowledge go back and look come back see does it sort out but I, want, I wanted to share this with you because some of the work that I and others have been doing, um, some of it we know, um, and some of it we're, we're re trying to, re we're remembering and we're filling in. Um, with the Piscataway feminine, um, the society um, itself originally was matrilineal. Matrilineal means it comes through your mother, your lineage comes through your mother. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that women are, completely in charge. It means that the line goes through the mother. Um, 
there's a studies that show that the economy was about 70 percent um, plant-based so uh, both going out into the um, into the world and uh, looking for for gathering berries nuts um, other kinds of amazing um, food sources that you can gather also um, agriculture very long-standing agriculture that's uh, scientists uh, use this term called interplanting, planting, and companion planting. Um, the three um, pillars of that, the three sisters, are corn, beans, and squash um, agriculture. Um, women with um, relationships to um, and roles as being healers, um, what we call clan mothers, which are extended family lineages, um, generally related very often to. Um, an originating animal relative. So my family are beaver clan. Um, so that's that's that lineage. There's other clans as well. Um, they could be council women um, sitting in a, a, a councilor, like you know, House of Representatives. They could be chiefs in their own right by their own merit, not just because they were married to a man. Um, who died and then you know somehow they succeeded or there was no other guy around and there was only the woman to do it. Um, there's and they had the the um, title of Warawanskwa. And again, this whole like cosmological view of um, red, black, or red, white. Um, I love this painting. This painting is by a beautiful, beautiful um, Mati Canadian artist named Christy Belcourt, um, and also her partner Isaac Murdoch. It's called New Beginnings in 2014. If you if you love art um, as I do, I would really um, I would suggest you go take a look at some of her work because even though it's from more like the Great Lakes region, um, there's so much Algonquian influence, so much wooded uh, water influence in there that it's somewhat more northern, but it really speaks to to many people. Um, so. I, I did want to go into, and some of you have seen um, some of this um, work and other other presentations I've given. But again, to frame it, um, I have what we call like a strange man's takeover, and this um, this starts in the 16th century um, in the 1560s with the Spanish uh, who come into the Chesapeake Bay and call it the Bahia de Santa Maria um, and take captives. Um, but we also then have uh, a group of, of people settling in who are English, um, it, further down south at Roanoke. Um, but disease patterns start to take place. We have 1607 is Jamestown. Um, that's when, you know, people come and they do not leave. Um, and then um, you have uh, traders and, and intermediaries and the world starts to really rapidly uh, shift in cataclysmic ways. Um, Maryland, as most of you probably know, is a Maryland colony. Um, this is a stained glass that's at St. Ignatius um, Church, St. Thomas Manor, which is right at the site of, um, really became the center for um, Pis Piscataway missionization. Um, our families still go to that uh, church. This is a more contemporary stained glass that was done to um, commemorate um, the baptism of people, so people became Catholic through the English Catholic uh, conversion. Uh, reservations or Indian manors uh, were set up. Um, we think about 30,000 at least acres uh, patented to um, native people, which I think I did a percentage <laughs> at one point. It was like, even if we got all of that back, um, it still is like teeny weeny little percentage of um, Maryland, so. Um, Unfortunately, um, all of that land was seized um, by the Protestant Revolution. People became subjects to um, Lord Baltimore, uh, to the Crown, were suffering from epidemics, which were in and of themselves not the only reason that um, people didn't recover because people recover from epidemics, right? But there's other stressors that are there, and that includes uh, warfare, clearing of land to plant cash crops like tobacco, uh, which then also means land is seized to expand um, enslavement of African-American people. 
extensive amounts of treaty making and breaking. And then we have many of our people um, end up leaving, actually fleeing in many ways, going outside of the Maryland boundaries to become guests of the Haudenosaunee or, or um, Iroquois people. Um, but we also have people who come back and we have people who, who consolidate and stay um, within our original area. So that's, that's kind of my um, three minute um, terrible, you know, really awful um, reality that happened. And um, any of you who've been following American Indian history as it moves west, we were really the among the incubators uh, for these policies that ended up um, moving out west and um, affecting uh, Native American people all you know coast to coast north to south and we were the people of of first hit um i did want to bring up tonight a, a person that um i've i've found and have been um contemplating and have uh, given a more extensive presentations on and i'm still looking into um but i did want to bring her up tonight because um, this is a, this is Nansenan is um, an Indian woman chief who was at Chaptico, um, who is recorded in the, um, who is recorded in the archives of Maryland. Um, and she sued um, the constable uh, because there had been settlers who had stolen uh, and raided her daughter's tomb, and she wanted restitution. What's significant about Nansen, among many other things, first of all, the idea that one of the last um, leaders um, in the Piscataway world who approached the English colony, um, who approached um, English and Marylanders, um, with on her own terms, within her own culture, um, with a speaker, with a retinue, um, in the form that wasn't uh, done as it was done later in much more of a kind of standard way, um, was a woman. Was a woman. Um, and she is pleading her case um, really from about 1706 to 1711, 1712, which is after most of um, the leadership um, has gone north. So the fact is, is that uh, what we see uh, among the, the, the last um, leaders who are culturally based and anchored, um, who are asserting their fullest sovereignty um, is a woman. And it really, uh, it really, really matters um, to think about this. And that she was, um, she was holding position for um, two much younger um, boys um, who would then potentially succeed her. But um, I do want you to remember her name. And as we think more about her and um, pursue that history, uh, to understand that 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 there are women um, all throughout uh, the all throughout Piscataway history, um, you know, essentially what we had was though a, a real loss in many ways of of women's power and position. Um, especially under the, you know, the, the, the Catholic, the English systems, people were subject to the same laws, including race law um, as, as their counterparts. So coming originally from a very powerful space, um, and this is unique, I think, in many ways for, you know, when we talk about uh, Native American women and we talk about women's rights, it's, not so much like this is a brand new thing. This is really getting back to um, a, a, a sense of, of balance, of empowerment, not power over, but power with, 
And as we've gone, especially in the 20th and 21st century, there was a growing trend to reclaim aspects of, of Native culture, of Native pride, of positioning. Um, and it tended to be often very um, male or male oriented. Uh, what we've started to look into, although, you know, there's always matriarchs and there's always grandmas and aunties and people, you know, who have occupied um, positions of, of political, cultural, social standing. Um, and at the same time, how is it that we're then able to start to really rebuild reconnection? You know, people who have uh, grown up in other places and they're coming back home or they were in the cities and they're coming back onto the land base, they're reclaiming their identities. And a big part of this is retouching um, into, into our homeland um, in a way that is uh, both ancestral and contemporary. So what I have in um, these photos is just a kind of a seasonal um, observation that I'm taking um, because I like so many, I grew up um, in a big city, I grew up in New York City and we have, um, I, you know, the family and some have grown up in DC or the DC area and then are going back uh, down or, or spending more time or relocating again back into um, our homeland. So I've been looking at um, really paying attention to a um, whole cycle. So like on the left, um, this is called a, a shad bush or a June bush that blooms. Um, in the spring um, and it's a calendar plant it indicates when the when the uh, when the uh, fish are running and then it produces um, berries which are edible and I think can also make dye so it's kind of like an early kind of spring we have early summer um, strawberry which uh, has a whole set of sacred narrative to it um, further to the north they call this uh, tonight is called the full strawberry moon I kind of think our strawberry moon is a little earlier because we started having strawberries earlier um, we have green corn um, uh, and then dried corn early varieties um, that that are being uh, restored as well into our areas that you know comes in in August and how looking at the restorations and, and fuller understandings of what green corn ceremonies are. And these amazing uh, dipper gourds that actually Denise Dunkley who's on tonight, um, she grew these along with her, her family and in her community. And um, we're restoring the understanding of the gourds and the seed carrying and the water carrying. So how, how we do that and um, looking at how to um, bring our girls back along with the boys, along with the men, the women, people who are um, of all genders. Um, but this is a, a group of um, young women who, who came in, um, in, in March, the end of March, and starting to restore, you know, how do we deepen our understanding of, of our practices? How do we um, work with that? And sometimes it means that we spend time um, with collections like you have at the Mac Lab. And sometimes it means that we connect to um, other people who are creating them. Um, and also looking into what our elders remember and what they can teach us and not be afraid to be um, creative. And all of that is a process of rematriation. So with that, I'm going to close um, and ask for um, questions and see if I can do a stop share as well. Just go ahead and do it. I think I, I think I did a stop share, but. You did, you did. You're okay, right. Right. okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, do we have questions? Anyone have any? Uh, you can put it in the chat or, or in the Q and A rather, or raise your hand if you got questions for Dr. Tai. Well, 
also looking at some of the ancestresses that are here, Grandmother Francisca, Lillian Coombs, Ashton and Ruth Gold Durham, Aunt Ludi. So good to good to see that as well. The first question is always the most difficult. So uh, I, I guess I, I would ask a little bit about the, the work you were do, doing over in, in England and, and maybe if you uh, want to talk about the, the fact that some of your your cultural items have made it across the sea there and uh, where we're at with that. Yeah, so, you know, um, so Piscataway is, is related in, in many ways to um, Powhatan. Uh, people and uh, very early on in in the 17th century uh, there were a number of items um, one being a shell um, embroidered um, hide with figures on it um, bows also original um, documents that had to do with the um, landings in Virginia and the interactions and so I, ha I was invited um, I was invited by the Ashmolean, which is at Oxford, to go and look at those materials. Um, it was the first time I had been in England. I was kind of resistant to it, um, just feeling like, oh, they stole so much of our stuff and, you know, caused so, so much heartache here. I'm not sure if I can, I don't really want to go. Um, and then I and then I did, and I'm so glad that I did, um, because uh, those, those materials, as we also see, um, I think, as you know, like at, at Jeff Pat, you know, with the with the archaeological lab, there's there's almost nothing that's not, um, you know, like pottery shards, right? Stone. So to see something that's actually, you know, made um, in leather or mat or things that can biodegrade, that's very rare for this area. And there's only really two places um, where that material is intact. One of them is in is in Oxford. And the other place is a little further up. Um, there's Susquehannock material in a castle in Sweden, because you know Delaware was new Sweden. Um, so that's the only place. So I think a lot of this is is trying to figure out um, the trace of of what what has happened so taking every route like i've taken er, almost every route both in uh, europe um i had gone to try to look at dutch collections like in leiden and amsterdam as well there's actually very little um from the region and then um also of course working at national museum of the american indian for many years and natural history um trying to see what that is but i think the best way we can start to look at that is by working with with people who are in live culture you know like that's something that to be able to understand it from people who maintain a living philosophy then going back again and looking at that material that's when you start to get it um you know that's really when you start to get it um and i think that that's something that we really we really need to um, think about more, um, especially as we look at um, laws like like the NAGPRA laws um, and the state repatriation laws and respect is enhanced between um, institutions and communities. And then, of course, some of us, you know, we're both in institutions and communities um, that we can start to open up the, the way of of understanding each other. Okay, we do have something that's popped up in the Q&A. It says, uh, will those countries share alone those items to museums in the U.S.? Is that something that can be requested? Yeah, so, I mean, those kinds of items, I think, really, um, you know, they can be requested. Um, sometimes they have traveled back, um, but Europe is not subject to U.S. repatriation law and that can be difficult so there's been some returns like there's been some returns but 
or at least loans. Um, but it's it's been much more difficult and much slower um, in Europe. So it's definitely worth going to take a look um, at things. Yet yeah, Sweden's on the list if you want to go <laughs> to go take a look. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely something um, in the docket. And I actually have a question, you know, for other people thinking about, um, yeah, what does it what does it take for us to um, be able to um, bring some of these back for for some of some of our you know the the women's traditions back, you know, even how to think about the moon's names, you know. So yeah, yeah, me too. So I think that those are, you know, those are questions of, that, that we might have as well. Do we have any other questions? So there's a question in the chat from Sarah Hall. And Sarah asks, where can I find your work, Gabby, to read further? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So I, I have some exhibits um, up at National Museum of the American Indian. Um, there's one that's called Return to a Native Place. It's there. Um, I also have some work that is um, published really on the interrelationships between um, Native people and African American people. Um, this work on rematriation for me um, is actually, you know, something that's been following me for a while, um, but one that I'm just starting to think through about how to publish. So stay tuned on that. Um, you know how how I'm going to work with this and and how it would be blended together. So that specific work um, is is pretty is pretty new work in a lot of ways. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay. All right. Again, thank you very much for uh, coming out and speaking with us. And uh, that was a, a wonderful talk and certainly informative. Uh, thank everyone for joining us virtually here. I do want to take a minute to say that our lecture series is sponsored by the Friends of Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, so if you're interested in the Friends, go ahead and check them out on their website at friendsofjppm.com. And then hopefully you'll join us next month. Or actually, we won't have a talk next month, but we will have a talk in, Sept or in August rather, uh, by Vincent Leggett, educator, author, and founder of the, Black or the president of Blacks of the Chesapeake Foundation. And he's going to talk about historically black beaches in Southern Maryland. So thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Tayak, again for a wonderful talk. All right. Thanks so much. It was really nice to be with everybody tonight. Take care. <laughs>